Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can be with you in your house this morning to, to sing songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Father, that we might edify each other. And Father, we pray that, uh, that, that Keith would bring the word and that we would listen and our hearts would be illuminated by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, it is good to be with you this morning and to be able to preach for those that may be visiting. My name is Keith Beck. I'm, the, I'm actually the youth pastor here. And uh, Kevin has asked me to preach not just this week, but also next week. So you can kind of make your judgments this week on whether or not you want to come back next week, I guess. Uh, so uh, we're going to be in Mark 4 today. So if you want to go ahead and start turning there, that would be great. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a very scary moment in my life. One of the one of the most terrifying moments of my entire life. Uh, when I was in seminary, I uh, was working like a dog, and I was, when I wasn't working, I was studying and preparing for papers and tests and all of the above while married. So um, things were a lot easier in college when I was a single person, and I wasn't working, and I could just do nothing but do work, and that was, that was easy. Seminary came with a little bit different level of responsibility, and so at first, uh, I was a little disheveled my first semester. I was kind of trying to figure it all out, how to balance all these different things. And uh, something that I've been known to do in the past, and I, I did there at seminary, I got my syllabi kind of mixed up between different classes and, and wasn't straight on when certain things were happening. And so I went in the last day of actual class before the week of finals, and I sat down in my Greek class, and I sat there ready to kind of open up the book and start talking about the test that was coming up. And next thing I knew, my professor said, okay, everybody, close your books, put them away, and started handing out this, this packet of papers. And I thought, what is this? And it dawned on me that the, that day was the final, and that I didn't know that the final was there. And it wasn't like I was doing some kind of systematic theology class in which I'd be like, oh, okay, it's fine, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. No, it was Greek. So I, terrified, shaking in my boots, thought, I am going to fail Greek just because I didn't realize the test was not coming the week of finals. It was coming the last day of actual class. So they passed out the test, and before I knew it, I had taken it, and I, I actually felt good about it. And when I actually got my test results back, I did well. 
I did well. I did just fine in the class. Uh, I managed to pull off a B on a test that I had not prepared for or studied for. And so uh, the reason I tell you that is uh, because there are sometimes test moments in life. And that was a big test for me. Not just had I done the, the, the study to, to prepare for the one day of the test, but did I really know the knowledge that I had been learning all semester long? And what I actually learned was, surprisingly, I had retained quite a bit of Greek that I didn't know. Now, what I don't tell you is that I had taken Greek in college as well. So I had kind of a primer, and it was, I was a lot easier. If I hadn't done that, maybe I would have been in a lot more trouble. But when the day of the test came, and I took that test, as scared as I was that I had I messed up and I, and I wasn't able to prepare for it the way that I would have liked to have prepared, I ended up passing the test and doing quite well on it because I was already prepared not knowing that, because I had done the work all semester long to know what I was going to be tested for. That's what we're actually going to kind of be talking about today, because when it comes to certain things in life, we would like to know that there's been a test done to know that we can put our faith and our trust into something, right? When I put my children in their car seats, I'd like to know that that car seat company has done the work to figure out whether or not those, that, that a child of the size it says can sit in that chair would survive a minor to moderate accident, maybe even potentially a severe accident. I want to know that everything is probably is going to be okay because someone else did the work. When you drive over a bridge, you'd like to think that some engineer somewhere had done some kind of stress test to know that it can withhold traffic sitting still on that bridge for hours at a time. Right? Uh, I remember when we were in Louisville at one point, they had to shut down a very important bridge in, in Louisville because somebody had come along, done a little test on it, and realized, oh, this bridge is compromised, and we could be looking at a tragic accident if we don't do some, some hard work on this right now. And so that caused all kinds of problems for a city, but at the same time, what it resulted in was people being safe going over a bridge. And so there's, there's times in which we want to, we, we, we get tested. And we want to look at the results of that test to figure out where are we truly. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower and the seeds. Uh, If you've been in church for any amount of time, you've probably heard this passage taught uh, multiple times, preached on, all of that stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this shortly today. And we're going to take a test of what kind of soil are we. And so let's read the passage real fast. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell along the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with, 12, with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. They are those who, and others are the ones who sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold 
and 60-fold and 100-fold. So let's talk about what we need to know right off the bat here. When we're talking about a parable, we need to understand what Jesus is using as kind of the, uh, kind of the, the key to understand what each thing represents. That when we read a parable, we don't just go willy-nilly into it and kind of let things represent what we want them to represent. Okay? It's not just kind of an open invitation to turn it into your metaphor that you want to take to the nth degree. Jesus has created a story, and there are certain things that he's defined, and he wants us to know what they are. And from there, we can launch into understanding what this passage means. So first off in this parable, we see that there's a sower. There's someone who's walking around, and they're scattering seed all over the ground. And we know that this sower is God. God is the one who is, who is throwing out the seed. He's scattering it wherever he wills. He's not, he's not throwing it intentionally on, on the good soil and then walking over here and throwing it right there. No, he's just scattering it to anyone and everyone. It's just being thrown out. The seed itself, we see, is the word of God. It's the gospel. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. And, it's, and that is the seed that's being thrown all over the place. So if we know right off the bat that we have a sower who is God and we have the seed which is the word of God, the attention becomes on what is different in this passage. Because the sower remains the same. The seed remains the same, but yet the soil changes in this passage multiple times. We've got hard soil, we've got soil that is shallow, and we've got soil that is, that is kind of choked out by the thorns and does not have a good place to grow. And then we've got good soil that creates a harvest. So what I want to talk to you about is the four different hearts that hear the word of God. And maybe help you identify where you land on this. Because I think it's important that we take a test every so often and figure out where is it that we stand. Do, are we someone of good soil that produces a harvest in our life, a fruit when God's word is preached and taught to us when we open up its pages and we read from it? Or have we been deceived in some way into believing that? And yet, when we take a close examination of our life, we find that something's not quite right. See, he says here that those who have ears, let, let them hear. And there's something about Scripture that teaches us that, God, that, that the ears are in some way connected with the state of a person's heart. James actually says this. He says that we are not just to be hearers of the word, but we are to be doers of the word also. So just based on James alone, we know that the way that we listen and hear God's word has a direct correlation, an effect on what, on, on, based on what is going on inside our hearts. Whether or not we receive God's word with joy, whether or not we receive it with, with indifference, or whether or not we receive it with kind of a, an kind of an opposed position of, of rejecting it, or whether or not we receive it in a way in which it, it is like a well that we return to for nourishment. We're going to find that out today. So, of the four people here, we have a person that is devoured, we have a person that is scorched, and we have a person that is choked, and then finally we've got a person who is growing. Which one are you? We will see. So, verse 13, Jesus talks about the fact that there is... This, he starts to explain this parable to his disciples who, who, who themselves don't understand what's going on here. And he says that the first soil is, soil is like the path. It's the seed has been scattered and some of it throws upon just a rocky path. And therefore, nothing happens from it. It doesn't have anywhere to take root. It doesn't have any place to make home. It simply just dies. It's dead on impact, practically, because nothing will ever come from a seed on a rocky path. Um, and so, what does this represent? The, the path, the rocky path person, is a person who is completely and utterly spiritually blind. And we need to realize this, because not only in this passage are we going to find that God is sowing seed, but we, each and every one of us in here, if you are a believer, you too are called to scatter the seed. That you're not to choose. You don't know if you're talking to a rocky path. You don't know if you're talking to someone that is amongst the thorns. You don't know what the soil is. You are called like God to just, just throw it everywhere and anywhere you go. So I think it's important, even if maybe no one in here is the devoured person, the person thrown along the path, it's important that we understand the path. Because 
you may realize this as we talk about this, but our world is becoming more and more a place of the past where the word is scattered and it is immediately rejected. It is immediately opposed. It, it is a person takes an immediate offense against it. And we need to understand this so that we know what we're up against. That when we are out there and we're sharing God's word, when we are scattering the word of God, telling people the good news, whether it's a family member, whether it's a coworker, or it's someone in our neighborhood or anyone that we just bumped into, there is a really good likelihood that we're going to bump into someone who's of this, this path, this person who is completely spiritually blind. I want us to look at Ephesians 2, because in Ephesians 2, it tells us exactly what, um, what the state of this person is and how to understand a person of the path. Ephesians 2 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit I found the principle of the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So just based on Ephesians 2, what we see is the person of the path is a person who just outright rejects God's word on its surface. There's not a considering of the, the veracity of its claims. Uh, there's not a struggling with it and trying to figure out if that's something that they, they want to believe. No, instead it, it, it says just like birds that just come in and they immediately devour it because it's exposed. It has nowhere to hide. It has no home. And he says that these birds are Satan. Ephesians 2 tells us that, that the person who is, who is just lost in their sin, the person of the past path is someone who is driven by their desires, that, the, that their, their desires, their appetites are that which drives them. Now, I'm currently on a diet, and not the kind of diet that you can define, okay? By, it's a customized diet just for me. I get to make the rules. It's so much easier that way. Do you not agree? Uh, and a couple of things that I've done is I've stopped drinking soda. I've kind of limited my, uh, my uh, portions and I'm kind of not snacking all the time like I want. Because here's the truth. Just two years ago, I could eat as much food as you could fit in my kitchen over the course of a day. And I wouldn't gain weight. It just didn't happen. You know? And some people say, well, I, I hate you for ever being that way in adulthood. But let me tell you, it was a burden. It was a burden. I had to eat those calories because my metabolism so fast, I was going to die if I didn't eat. Uh, but now I eat and suddenly I gain a little weight. And so I realized, you know what? I've got three little kids I want to be around. I don't want to just let, you know, just kind of let myself go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start taking care of myself a little bit better. So I started dieting, meaning I don't drink Coke anymore, which is a really hard thing for me to do. Maybe you don't even like Coke, but I like Coke. It's good. I like the bitterness of it. If I have French fries or I have certain other meals like pizza, then I want a Coke. And what I've learned in my dieting is that my, there, my body and my will are truly at war over desires, more than I ever imagined they would be. It's really easy to say, well, I want that cupcake, so I will eat that cupcake. You know, I feel like going in the kitchen and, and grabbing another bowl of cereal, so I'm going to do that. And it's easy because it makes your body happy. It's what your stomach is craving. It's what you want, and so you just do it. But suddenly when you decide to make a decision against the body, against the desires, you realize how opposed your will can be to your own body. They go, they go at war with each other. And so literally my body all the time says to myself, oh yeah, well if you think you're going to cut out Coke, I'm going to make you utterly miserable until you drink one. And I haven't. I haven't been drinking a Coke, I haven't drunk Coke for like nine or ten weeks now. And it is hard. But the person of the path, they're a person who simply follows their, di follows their desires wherever they go. They feel like cupcake, they eat the cupcake. They feel like drinking the Coke, they drink the Coke. It doesn't matter if it's one or it's six. They're just going to do it because it's what their appetite desires. And Ephesians 2 says that, that 
who is it that they serve? They think they serve themselves. They think they deserve that they serve their desires. But in fact, it says that they serve Satan. That they serve his spirit, the prince of the power of the air. That opposition to God and what he desires for his people to do and be. So when we're out there and we are spreading God's word, we're spreading the good news, we need to realize there are the people of the path. And there's many of them. And when the word of God comes upon their ears, it is immediately devoured. It's immediately taken away and stolen. And there is no fair hearing of it. There's no struggle. There's no trying to to war with those ideas and whether or not they're true. There's just outright rejection. And so there are some that we see here, that Jesus explains to us, there are some of a certain soil, not really even a soil, but a path, that the, the Word of God will not, will not be successful. It'll just simply throw in seed up against a concrete wall. There's a second person here, though, and this is the person that is scorched, the person of the rocky soil. And here Jesus says in verse 16, and these are the ones... Sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And when they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while, then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now, I think it's interesting about this person, because it says that they receive the word of God immediately with joy. So, this person can obviously understand the appeal of God's word. They, they hear it and... And they're not like the person of the path. They don't outright reject it. They don't even maybe find it offensive. But they find instead joy in its words. They find value in it. Oh, yeah, that's, I need that. Yeah, that's good. And they're, they're uplifted and they're excited and energized by the word of God. But like this seed that grows very quickly, it never bears fruit. In fact, it says as soon as the sun comes out... The sun, which should be a life-giving aspect of of the process, ends up being the thing that ends up destroying this plant. That it never produces fruit. It's scorched under its its heat. under, Under any kind of hard circumstances, it can't withstand. It dies and it withers away. And here's the thing about this person. As though they get the appeal of God's word, they lack an ability or a real desire to follow through with it. This person may be the kind of person that, that struggles in life with their faith. Maybe does, doesn't even come to church all that often. But then they, they pop in every so often when the guilt just weighs on them. And there's this burden of, of, you know you need to be at church. You know you need to do that thing. And you go in, and, and it's almost like a release of all of that, of that tension. And you hear the word of God and there's joy and there's excitement. Oh, this time I'm going to change. This time I'm going to get serious about God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go home and I'm going to be a better father or a mother. I'm going to go home and I'm going to start telling people about Jesus. I'm going to go home and I'm going to stop doing that thing that God's been trying to tell me not to do forever. But the second that they go, something difficult enters their life, any kind of season of suffering or or hardship it scorches their faith and it doesn't withstand interestingly the believer is told in james that that we are to to count it all joy through our trials and our our tribulations that 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 we're told in romans 5 that 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 endurance is is the fruit of suffering and hardship in this life that it strengthens our faith But this person does not result in that way because there's no, there's shallow soil. There's no real root. Maybe this person is someone who builds their faith upon their their friends or of their family that are more serious about their relationship with the Lord, who are thriving and growing. And and they, they almost glean and steal from the fruit of their life to justify their own faith. But however it is, this is a person who simply is not growing. There's a a quick burst of energy, but then there's no follow-through whatsoever. Here's a third person. And this is the person that's choked. The person of the thorny soil that, that is cast. And Jesus says in verse 18, and others are the ones 
sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves to be unfruitful. So, interestingly, the scorched person is said to receive God's word with joy. And then we come to the person of the thorns, and there is no mention of joy upon hearing the word of God. That doesn't mean that they don't experience joy in hearing it. But it's an interesting thing that Jesus kind of withholds from that part of the story. That he kind of, he pulls out from that. That there, that there seems to be a difference between the rocky ground person who, who is energized by God's word immediately and this person of the thorns that no mention of, 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 it, of energy and excitement and joy. Maybe that's because their heart is already captivated by something. Maybe this is the person, as we see here, that, that for a season... They're, they look to be growing. This is not like the rocky person who grows real fast. It, there's, a, there's an appearance of fruit real quick, but it sputters out real fast too. It has no longevity. This person of the thorns, they can go a lifetime of, of, being decept, of deceiving everyone around them, of deceiving themselves, of, of thinking to themselves that they are the good soil. When all along, Week after week, they come to the church. They hear the word of God. They hear the call of what they must do and how they must change and, and what, what God is calling them to do out there. And yet, when they leave, the things of this world distract them, pull their attention away from the word of God. It doesn't, it doesn't survive the, the environment it's in that the things are so attractive to them, the riches and the pursuit of, of things in this life have so deceived them that they, they find contentment in that. They find purpose and, and their, their reason for being in those things and not in being faithful to God's Word. Jesus is not the most valuable thing to the person of the thorns. This world is. They're in love with the world. And because of that, their hearts are continually lured away from Jesus to the world to serve those things, to pursue those things to the exclusion of Jesus. And this person may be a person that comes to church and, and maybe even in their daily life thinks to themselves, you know, one of these days, <clears throat> I'm going to set this stuff aside and I'm really going to, I'm going to change. I'm going I'm gonna, to I'm gonna live completely sold out for Jesus. But yet, there always seems to be another thing in the world that they're chasing, that they're after. Their desire is to make this world home, to find true contentment in that thing you want. Maybe it's that title at work. Maybe it's that possession that you just think if you had that, that it would be, it's your life goal to own this thing or have that, that it would, that it would make you finally feel fulfilled in life. Finally, you could rest and be content and not chase and pursue things anymore because you attained it. Maybe it's a person or a relationship, whatever it be. Utterly, Jesus says here, at the end of the day, He says that this is deceitful. That this person has been lied to. That, that they, are, they are believing a lie that these things will bring that contentment. That when they finally attain them, if they ever do, they will find themselves still discontent. Still after more things, never truly finding rest in this world, never finally finding a place where they can stake down their tent and make home as bad as they desire to do so. This, this is a very dangerous place to be because you can easily go an entire lifetime being of the thorns and being a very religious person. You can, you can have great attendance in Sunday school, you, you can even be volunteering in certain ministries. But at the end of the day, the response to the word is the true indicator of where your heart lies. See, I, myself, I do not think to myself that I'm a believer because at some point in time, the deacons laid hands on me and ordained me as a minister of the gospel. I don't think 
that I'm a believer because currently I'm standing on stage preaching God's word or I'm on staff at a church. See, just like, just like you, Satan lies to me too. And he comes up to me and he says, you think that God really could save a sinner like you, Keith? You really think that someone like you could be redeemed? I mean, some of these other people out there, but, but not you. You know, you know your thoughts. You know what you've done. There's no way. And when those doubts arise, the place I go to is not to my ordination or to my sitting on staff or anything I have ever done in my lifetime. Those are not the backstop. You know, I, when you watch baseball or softball or whatever, there's always that backstop that kind of sits behind home plate. And when the person swings and misses and the catcher doesn't catch the ball, they don't have to run 100 yards to go get the ball like you do in, in some kind of like park out there somewhere. Right? They, they have a backstop that they, that they know the ball will go no further than there. And they can go back and get it. Brothers and sisters, the backstop for the believer is not what people's opinions of us are or our standing with people. It is not anything we've ever done. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is His righteousness and His righteousness alone. It is His word and, spo- and His word spoken over you that if you have turned from your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will be forgiven. That you will be saved. That is our backstop. That is our confidence. And so a person of the thorns may be finding their confidence in all kinds of different places because they're so distracted in pursuit of things. Finally, the last person is the person of the good soil. And Jesus says about this person in verse 20, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. See, the good soil is the person who responds to God's word in the right manner. It's not a person that likes to just hear a good sermon As I've said in the past, they're not the spiritual triage person that just wants to make sure their pulse is, they're alive. I heard the word, I'm convicted, so I'm still alive. It's the person who hears the word of God and is convicted by it, is motivated by it, is changed by it to live a new life out there. That the word is not about this moment, but the word is about every moment that follows. That is the good soil person. Because in this room, we don't have time to bear fruit. We just, this is just scattering seed here. But over time, the week and the months and the years ahead of your life playing out, the way you love your family, the way that you work amongst your coworkers, the way that you interact with your neighbors, the things that you value and pursue in this life, they will reveal where your heart really lies. Are you the good soil that bears fruit? And and, and this fruit goes on to not just bless your life, but it blesses the people's life around you. See, the person of the good soil, if you were to look into their life, you would find someone who, when they are having hard times, they run back to the Word of God. They run to the people of God. They look for nourishment there. When you look at the person of the good soil, you see a person whose life is, is, is defined by wisdom and humility and love. It's a person who's producing fruit in all areas of their life, whether it be in their home, whether it be at church, whether it be at their work. They are the same person because God has a hold on their heart because His Word has taken root there. And it continues to grow. For a lifetime, it continues. And not just in your life, but then it spills over into other people's lives who are around you, who hear the Word of God, and so too do change and, and, are, and are nourished by it. Even given life by it. Are you the person of the good soul? Do you respond to God's Word in the correct manner? Because the correct manner is not just to hear it. 
James tells us, you don't just hear the word, you have to do it. If you're a person that hears the word and doesn't do it, you're like the person that looks into the mirror and walks away and immediately forgets what you look like. Because it's supposed to affect you. When you see the mirror and you see, oh, my hair is all out of whack and, and I've got a pimple on my nose and I've got, you know, something in my teeth. And then you just turn around and you go out like none of that stuff is true. You're the person that's being, you're deceiving yourself. You're, you're not doing what the mirror is, is requiring of you, which is to fix yourself. <laughs> fix these things. We are to look in the mirror and see, oh, wow, I'm inadequate and, I, and, and I'm a sinner and, and I, I'm, I'm so much less than, than, than what I'm called to be. Man, I need Jesus today. I need grace. I need His mercy. And you turn around and you walk out and you live in view of all those things. So let's talk about real fast this good soil person versus the other soils, okay? And then I'm going to conclude, and we're going to get out of here and, and rush maracas. Actually, I've been told we're not eating maracas today, so um, you won't see us there. The good soil person versus the devoured person. See, the devoured person we see that is the person that rejects God's word because it offends them. It, it, it literally, it, 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 it's extremely offensive in that it tells them that they're, they're not good enough. It tells them that they're a sinner. It tells them that... They need help. It tells them that maybe their lifestyle is not acceptable to God. While the good soil person is offended as well, they're offended by the word, but instead of just being offended, they're also convicted and they're grieved by it because they realize that they are, they, they, that it's true. That it's true that, they, that they, are, they are what it says they are. The scorched person falls away because of the hardness of life. Yet, we said it earlier, the good soil person returns to the word when they're, when they're running into hard times, when suffering arises. The choke person falls away because they love the things of this world and they find them to be a, a lure. But the good soil person realizes what those things really truly are. They, they're able to put those things in perspective because God's word has, has illuminated that for them in their life. They know that contentment is only found in the gospel and in Jesus Christ. So I hope that tonight, or tonight, today, sorry, I got up really early this morning, so it's, it's about night for me now. Um, I hope that this is a good test for you. That maybe in this time, you're able to, to sit and, and, and consider the truth of these four different soils that Jesus has laid out for us. That maybe you're the hard soil person. And you're here not because you want to be. But somebody drug you here this morning. I don't know. And this message is incredibly offensive. Maybe a person that's watching on YouTube later, six weeks from now, stumbles upon this video for who knows why. But they start watching and they listen to these words and they say, yeah, I absolutely deny all of that and hate that. Maybe that's, maybe that's where you're at. But more likely, people in this room are people of the rocky, the thorn, and the good soil. There's those of us in here that are struggle. We're, it's like a sprint. We have a burst of energy and we run, but, but the race is a long one. And so we don't finish. When I ran cross country, I had a 5K I had to run every time I raced. And I did really, really well for a while. But by the time I got to the end of my season, ranked in the top 20 in the mid-state, was completely expected to, to go to state and place well, and then the race that I had to qualify for state came and I failed miserably. I failed miserably. Not even close to qualifying. My gr great season, but didn't make it to the end. Should have been there, wasn't there because I didn't race well at the end of the day. I did, had a really good start to the season, really poor end. It, it was all for nothing. And Maybe some of us in here are the people that really are struggling with the things of this world. We, want, we love the world, but we, but we, at the same time, know that we need to, to, be, we need to be faithful to Jesus. And so there's always this tension. And for some reason, the things of this world just keep winning that tug-of-war match and pulling us on over. And maybe today you're the good soil person. 
Whatever it is, my encouragement to you is that there's grace. There's grace. Just because you're a person of, of the rocky soil, just because you're a person of the thorns, does not mean that this altar is not open to you. It does not mean that you are somehow, that, that there's, this is not fatalism. You are not doomed to be this forever. You may have been rocky soil, but today God wants to make you good soil. And hear the word. This is why Jesus says, those who have ears, let them hear. Hear the word of God. If it convicts your heart, if you realize that you have not been what he's, this good soil, today is the day of salvation for you. Today is the day to reject the things of this world and come to him. Not tomorrow, not next week, today. Come today. I know the pastor's not in, but God's still accepting sinners. Kevin's not anybody, he's not the one that receives people into the kingdom of God. That's Jesus' job. Today is the day to respond in faith and come to him. And this is my last encouragement to you. Many of us in here, we could be better about being a sower of the seed. At the end of the day, this call is not just for those of us who are of the other soils. But this is a call for the good soil person. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. How do you bear fruit? Take the Word of God home with you. Take the Word of God to work with you. And not just that, but then scatter the seed. Do the work of your Father and sow the seed along with Him. And do not be discouraged when you come across the person of the path or you see the person of, uh, of, of the rocky ground and you think because of their initial response that this is a, this is a child of the kingdom, you, you've done a good work, but then you see them walk away not very far after. Don't be discouraged when you see a person who struggles with, with leaving the world behind to follow Jesus. That's not your job. You're not the person that makes the soil good. You're the person who scatters the seed. Leave the soil to the gardener. Leave it to the Father. But you were called to be obedient, to bear fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold in your life, by scattering that seed out into the world, to those that are near and around you. So I want everybody just to stand and, and bow your heads now as we pray and we close. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do, because... It's really easy to sit through a message and to kind of let it be what it is and get out of here and go feed your stomach because it's doing like mine right now. It, it wants to be fed, right? And I find too many times on a Sunday morning that, that by the time I get out of service and I'm heading my, heading my way to Las Maracas, I should get some kind of like commission from them for mentioning them on YouTube multiple times today. But... By that time, I start forgetting what, what went on here. What am I, what am I called to do again? What, what was today all about? And it's really easy to just go from one week to the next. And I'm going to ask you right now to just bow your heads. And I want you to ask God to reveal to you where your heart's at. Are you the person who seems to just have really short but intense spurts in your life where you're excited about Jesus and you want to obey Him and you want to, to, to be the most devoted follower of His. But you spend far more time away from Him than with Him. If so, maybe, maybe the problem is that your root is shallow. That the Word of God has not ever truly penetrated the depths of your heart to reveal your sin and your desperate need for Him that might bear, that, that, that might be like a well in your life, feeding, nourishing you for a lifetime. Maybe you're in here and you say, you know, maybe I'm one of those that's been deceived by the things of this world. I've been pursuing everything in this life but Jesus. I give him Sunday, I'll give him sometimes a Wednesday. And, and if somebody were to ask me 
what my uh, religion I am. I, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a church-going Christian. I attend Sunday school. I do all these things. But maybe it's the kind of faith that never really goes home with you, other than in thought, and that it's what you believe. But when it comes to follow-through, when it comes to action, when it comes to fruitfulness in your life, it just doesn't seem to ever bear fruit. Today may be the day that you need to say, God, I, I am no longer pursuing the riches of this world, the things that it can give me, and I want to find ultimate contentment in you. Take my life. Give me that sense of purpose and meaning that I'm looking for in other things, and show me what this really truly is about that I've been saying that I've been a part of for all this time. For you that are of the good soil, I'm going to encourage you this morning. Maybe God reveals that to you today. Maybe the day where you say, you know what? I, I've been a great parent. Or I, I've, I've been a, a godly workman, workwoman out there in the, in the workforce and, 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 and all of that. But, but I'm not doing what I ought to do in scattering God's seed to, to, to the people to hear and, and see God bear harvest through my life. God wants to use each and every one of you in this room today to take His good news of His kingdom and share it with those that don't know about it. And entrust Him to be the good gardener that He is. You will find good soil out there. You will. They're out there. The, the field is, is wide into the harvest. But the, the workmen are few. We need to lift up our eyes, good soil people, and share the gospel. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray that this morning as we now sing truth once again to you, and Father, the test of our hearts might be revealed that the results might come in and, and the Father, you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see what it is that's going on in our hearts. Father, you, your word tells us that the heart is deceitful, that, that it can't be trusted. Father, when it is you lifting the veil and you giving us the wisdom and, and revealing to us what is true about our hearts, Father, we can see. And so God, I pray that this morning that some would be convicted by the lack of follow-through in their life when it comes to your word, and then others would be encouraged to see your hand in their life. And that by today, Father, we might leave here emboldened to bear fruit for your kingdom. Whether today is the first day we decide to follow you, or we just continue today. Pray that you receive glory in your son's name. Amen.